Hello. So in this video, we're going to talk about Euripides' Hippolytus. Now, I really like Hippolytus as a play, in part because um, for my doctoral dissertation uh, in the introduction to, to that project, I looked at a number of Hippolytus adaptations, and so I, I sort of developed a, a real fondness for the play. It's one of the best examples, I think, in extant Greek tragedy of the hubris is punished model. Um, and so that's, as, as, as Aristotle tells us in the Poetics, that's one of the things that uh, we get in, in Greek tragedy, in successful Greek tragedy. Um, is this idea of a tragic error, which the tragic error is almost always, or the tragic error is often a form of hubris, of overweening pride or arrogance specifically against the gods. So I want to start um, with the prologue, because in the prologue, Aphrodite sort of, ex there. so for me, there's, step back a bit, so for me, there's there's sort of two major cycles of hubris here. One is by Hippolytus and the other is by Theseus, and I'll talk about both of them. So um, I want to start with the prologue because Aphrodite gives us the introduction to Hippolytus's hubris. So Aphrodite enters, she says, Mighty am I on earth and mighty in heaven, named by many a name. I, Aphrodite, who have under my sway every living soul in the light of the sun, from the Exeun seashores to the Atlantic main, I honor those who reverence my power, but the proud and resistant heart I bring to the ground. Even the gods you see delight in the homage of mankind. Let me show you the truth of what I say. Hippolytus, son of Theseus and the Amazon, and brought up by Pythias, that true-hearted man has defamed and blasphemed me treated me as the, the most despicable of gods. He alone in all Trojans spurns love, turns his back on the very idea of sex. He worships Artemis, Zeus's daughter, reveres her above all deities, ranges with her in continual partnership as he sweeps through the woods with his swift hounds emptying the green wild. I do not begrudge him that. Why should I care? But for this, his slight to me, I mean to punish Hippolytus today. Indeed, his road to ruin is already cleared. It needs but a little more. So that's the first portion of the prologue. So basically, what's happened here is that Hippolytus is so stridently opposed to sex, sexuality, romance, love of any kind, that he's completely devoted to Artemis and while that's not necessarily in itself a huge problem, he actively spurns Aphrodite. He refuses to even acknowledge her statues, much less give her any sort of worship. So this is Hippolytus's overweening pride, his arrogance against the gods. And Aphrodite determines to bring him down for it. So basically what she does is she infects his mother, his, his stepmother, sorry. Uh, she infects his stepmother, Phaedra, with an overwhelming love for Hippolytus. She physically suffers for her, her need for Hippolytus. Um, now, this is, a, this, a, this is actually one of the really interesting things in later versions of the Hippolytus myth, because in Euripides, Phaedra is basically like, yeah, everyone, I need to kill myself because I'm so in love with Hippolytus and I can't have him. I'm going to I'm gonna kill myself. Problem solved. In other versions, in the version by Seneca or by Jean Racine, um, Phaedra is actually much more on board with the idea of confessing her love to Hippolytus and sort of seeing how it goes. In Euripides, she's not. She is 100% opposed to that. But the nurse manages to convince her 
Because the nurse, what the nurse fundament, what 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 uh, Phaedra's nurse fundamentally wants is to keep her mistress alive. So the nurse convinces Phaedra to let her tell Hippolytus. Um, And Hippolytus is not pleased with this news. Um, Hippolytus, realistically, somewhat predictably, says, No, I don't want to have an affair with my stepmother. That's weird. I'm going to tell my dad, because this is pretty fucked up. Phaedra... Uh, reflects on what the nurse has, has done, has convinced her to, to allow it done. Phaedra says, she has destroyed me, divulged my obsession, and done it with love. Damaged me, er, damned me by her cure. So we've got that component here, that sort of fate has, has destroyed me component that we have throughout Greek tragedy. So, rather than face Theseus and the accusation by Hippolytus uh, that she has tried to seduce him, Phaedra decides she's going to hang herself, which she does, but she leaves a note before she dies to Theseus saying that Hippolytus attempted to rape her. This is one of the few things that Euripides doesn't explain well. Generally, Euripides is quite good at explaining people's motivations, but this is one of the things that it's not quite clear why she's done that. Um, It seems like she's trying to think through, like, what can I do that will help secure my children's future and make sure that they aren't under a cloud of suspicion? But it's not really well explained. So, she leaves this note. Theseus finds it, and what he says is the choking obscenity. I cannot contain it. It must out. Break through the portals of my mouth. My city, my city, in the full glare of Zeus's holy eye, Hippolytus has ravaged my wife. Father Poseidon, hear me. You promised me once three curses. Let me have one of them now to destroy my son. If there is power in them, let him not escape this very day. So basically, Hippolyt- or Theseus says, Theseus, so Poseidon is Theseus's father. Hippolytus, uh, sorry, Theseus calls on his father Poseidon to destroy his son Theseus because he believes the accusation in Phaedra's letter. Now, interestingly, the chorus leader says, For the sake of the gods, can cancel that prayer. Believe me, you'll come to know in time the mistake you have made. So this introduces us to the second round of hubris. Theseus's hubris here in calling on his father Poseidon to destroy his son based just on this note. Um, What happens is that uh, so when, when when Hippolytus gets back Theseus basically says you're banished get out of my my house, out of my kingdom but Hippolytus takes his chariot and he's riding along the seaside when Poseidon sends a great bull up out of the ocean and this bull spooks Hippolytus' horses who take off and they, they basically pull him out of the chariot and he's dragged along this rocky seashore And it's just this horrendously painful, slow death. And Artemis comes to Theseus. And basically, Artemis says, Hey man, uh, you prayed for your son to be killed by Poseidon, but actually he was innocent. He did not rape Phaedra. He didn't even try to rape Phaedra. Actually, she was in love with him. You made a huge mistake, and now your son is horribly dying. Uh, And she actually says here, Your father Poseidon, king of the deep, with only good intentions to honor his word, consented. But both of us, he and I, consider your action wrong. 
after you proceeded without examination, without proof, without auguries, and without waiting for the revealing hand of time to release curses against your son and kill him. So this is Theseus punished for his overweening pride. And then we have the, the almost dead Hippolytus brought on basically to forgive his father for what he's done. But this is Hippolytus's punishment for scorning Aphrodite, is that he is dragged to death along the seashore um, as punishment for his pride against the gods. So Hippolytus is really interesting. It's a real it, the Euripides version is really interesting because. Like I, I mentioned before, there are two main later versions. There's the version by Seneca, the Roman playwright and philosopher, and there's the version by Jean Racine of the French Golden Age of, of uh, theater. And each of them takes dramatic divergences from this. In Euripides, um, Phaedra is... Actually, both of those plays are called Phaedra rather than Hippolytus. Um, so in Seneca, it, we'll, we'll start with this one. So in Euripides, um, Phaedra is more keen on killing herself than she is on actually having a relationship with Hippolytus. She recognizes that it can't happen, and she recognizes that it would be shameful, and so she she elects suicide, and it's only when the nurse talks her out of it that she changes her mind. Seneca takes a different approach to this. Some would say a more anti-feminist approach to this, because in Seneca's Phaedra, she's much more interested in confessing her love to Hippolytus and starting a relationship with him. So she's really the driving force there. And then the other interesting thing in, in Seneca's version is she doesn't, she kills herself after she publicly proclaims that Theseus has attempted to rape her. So in Euripides, she leaves a note. In Seneca, she states this in public before killing herself. So Seneca's Phaedra is much less the sort of... So, Euripides' Phaedra is much more the tool of the gods, the plaything of Aphrodite, uh, who's used by Aphrodite to take revenge. In Seneca, she's actually much more of a driving force, but not necessarily in a positive way. Um, and then in Racine, we actually get the introduction of an entirely new character, um, Arsine, who is Hippolytus' love interest, and they can't get married because she's daughter of an enemy king or something like this, and uh, Theseus wants to make sure she never has children so they can never challenge him for the crown, whatever it is. But because of French Golden Age, French classical theatrical conventions, you just you couldn't have a character who was like, no, no sex, no romance. I reject that. The French just wouldn't be able to get their minds around that idea. So you have a completely different shift here. We no longer have... There's also the, the fact that the French don't uh, believe in the, the classical Greek pagan gods. Um, so we have a complete shift from what we have in Euripides as Hippolytus to a version of the story in which uh, Phaedra can't have Hippolytus because he's in love with someone else. Which again, completely abandons the whole Aphrodite is taking revenge on this character for spurning her as a, as a deity storyline. 